Our last talk for the session is by Jilai Zhang. Uh, Jilai, do you want to turn on your video? And she's kindly woken up very early in the Australian time zone. Um, and Jabil, thank you so much for doing that and giving this talk. No, it, it, it's not too early. It's, um, but thank you very much for putting me in a time slot that's uh, actually quite, quite reasonable. Um, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Jelai Zhang and I'm a postdoc at the Sumban University of Technology in Melbourne, Australia. Um, thanks very much to the organizers. Um, I'm a bit sad that I can't be there in person, which we're, um, but I'm very thankful and also um, congrats to the organizers for getting everything onto a virtual platform so smoothly uh, with, with so, so little lead time. So um, in today's talk, I had originally three sections. I think I'm gonna skip the first section because the first section is uh, a short introduction to why Kilonova is so exciting. But <laughs> It looks like everyone here already knows that. Um, the second section, I'll quickly go through what a typical approach to finding Kilonova is. And the third section to argue that we should use an untriggered approach to find Kilonova. Um, and Roman can play a big role in that. In this short talk, if there's anything that I want you to take away from it, it's that we should definitely be doing untriggered searches for Kilonova. So this is my white Kilonova slide. Um, so what is the typical approach to finding a Kilonova? I think this might be covered partially already in some previous talks. So I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, I put typical approach to finding a kilonova because as we all know, there's only one spectroscopically confirmed kilonova, um, GW170817. Um, so, uh, so that's why typical is a bit strange to say. Um, so with the one known um, and confirmed kilonova, um, it was detected by a follow-up to gravitational wave and gamma ray burst event. The gravitational wave event showed that it was the merging of two neutron stars and it was able to localize the event to 28 square degrees on the sky, as well as um, a distance estimate of about 25 to 50 megaparsecs. Um, about two seconds after the end of the coalescing event, a gamma ray burst was emitted by the, the astrophysical phenomena. Um, and within six, Oh, I think six or seven minutes, both of these, um, so on the x-axis here is time, um, within six minutes, both the gamma ray burst and the gravitational event was alerted to the whole community, which prompted a whole series of follow-up um, in optical and infrared. And within 11 hours, a, a kilonova, which is the optical and infrared thermal signature of the ejecta was uh, discovered with the one meter two hemisphere telescope, um, which, which is really incredible. And it was localized to one galaxy, um, NGC 4993, um, and that allowed other, other uh, imaging to occur as well. So that was extremely exciting for the study of Kilonova. Um, and even though it happened in 2017, um, so, so many papers came out after that. I think I counted like 50 nature papers on this one single event. So if we, it would be amazing if we can find more events. And we've heard lots of um, exciting ways to be able to do this, but I'm proposing um, in, in this talk here to do an untriggered um, direct search in, in the optical and infrared without a gravitational wave or gamma ray burst um, trigger. So I'll go through why and how. So the first reason is we want to increase the rate of kilonova detection and confirmation. So I think the more methods um, and approaches that uh, together as a community we do, the better. And the alternative I'm proposing is this untriggered approach. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the limitations of gravitational wave detection. Uh, so when uh, for, for these kilonova, it has to involve a neutron star and neutron stars are less massive compared to um, black holes. And since uh, they're less, less massive, they're going to ripple space time uh, a lot less. 
And as a result, gravitational wave detectors cannot detect them out to very large distances. So for example, during operational run three of the LIGO um, gravitational wave detectors, we could detect um, binary neutron star mergers out to just over 100 megaparsecs um, in range. Uh, I, I learned something interesting recently, which is that range is different to horizon. Horizon is about 2.3. And range is um, the radius of the sphere whose volume is the volume surveyed. And for gravitational wave, uh, it's actually a peanut shape. Um, so combined with the fact that neutron stars are not massive and so cannot be detected large distances with gravitational waves um, is that uh, the, the rate of um, neutron star mergers um, isn't, isn't super high. So on, I recently discovered these two beautiful plots from Mandel and Floor in, from last year in Living Reviews and Relativity on binary coalescence rates. On the right-hand side, on the left-hand side is um, binary neutron star merger rates, and the right-hand side is neutron star black hole merger rates. And on the x-axis is um, giga, uh, the number per gigaparsec cubed per year. You can see it's very uncertain, which makes uh, this error of research quite exciting, um, but roughly these estimates all fall between 10 to um, about a thousand events per gigaparsec cubed per year. What is the advantage of doing the, the search directly in optical and infrared? Um, well, we can go to much larger distances. So if we just go to about 24 mags in imaging, then that allows us to see to a, over one gigaparsec. And very excitingly, it has different selection effects to the follow-up strategy, um, which may uh, allude us to a slightly different population of kilonova, which I think can enrich the science. So for example, um, the, the, it will, will be um, sensitive to kilonova at much higher redshifts, um, ones that are optically bright and um, independent of the gamma ray burst um, or merger event angle towards us as well. So what should we actually use as a strategy to find kilonova in an untriggered approach? Um, well, it um, relies on understanding some of the key differentiating um, characteristics of kilonova, um, which is very nicely highlighted in this plot by Igor from 2019. Um, so in the top here, it shows that kilonova brighten their light curves very quickly on about daytime scales, faster in the bluer bands and the redder and infrared bands. Um, and then afterwards, they will fade quickly. Um, on the bottom plot here is how many mags um, they, the kilonova fades each day. Um, and it's faster in the G and slower in, in the redder um, and infrared wavelength. This is just another way to see it, the, you know, the higher this beautiful plot, which I have now realized everyone here probably has seen many times already, um, but in these um, infrared wavelengths, the kilonova evolves slower and lasts much longer. So using the, um, the two defining features, that is a fast evolution of kilonova and the um, fast color change of kilonova compared to contaminants such as supernova, um, we can come up with a strategy of um, using two filters to catch that color change. And um, for the optical, what we want is really day cadence, but in the infrared, we can go to two day cadence. So now you might be wondering, does this strategy actually work? Can this get us um, many, many kilonova? Um, so let me present some case studies for numbers that we can expect. For these case studies, I've assumed um, in a peak magnitude that's the same as um, our GW170817 kilonova friend and an optimistic rate for um, merger events per volume per year. Um, don't worry that I'm using this optimistic rate. I'm using the same rate to compare to GW just to um, orientate everyone. So it's okay. My first case study is with DCAM instrument on the CTIO four meter telescope in Chile. Um, with its large field of view, um, we can get up to one kilonova every 49 days. If we use a observing strategy where we observe many filters per night, I will repeat that um, every night 
uh, in, in two bands. Now, this strategy I've, I've put here um, is during bright time. And the reason for that is actually the strategy is about to happen starting tomorrow, um, uh, where we'll be using DECAM to do exactly this to find kilonova over 11 nights. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's going to be very exciting with Roman. Um, with, uh, I put in, for example, if we use these two filters, um, which can get us to uh, this depth, um, 27.5 in one hour each, um, and we do a two-day cadence study, then we can do on the order of 20-something fields every two days, then we can discover up to one kilonova every 16 days, which is very exciting. And so perhaps for some of the already planned surveys, such as the um, high galactic latitude survey with Roman, we can do um, some uh, we, we can change the cadence from the suggested five days to a shorter cadence for a subset of the fields, uh, which would make this uh, possible. For comparison, um, this is very comparable to the typical way of finding kilonova with gravitational wave triggers, um, which using the same uh, rate, this optimistic rate, finds up to one neutron star merger event every 16 days. But of course, to find a kilonova with this, it depends on how well it's localized and um, also how uh, successful the search is um, with, with optical and infrared follow-up. Um, and, and so far, we've only been able to do this for, for one event. All right, and that, that's, that's my talk. I hope I've convinced you that we should go for the strategy to find um, Kilonova using an untriggered search method. Thanks. Thank you, Gile. That was uh, that was fun. Um, questions for for Gile? I don't see anything on Slack. If anybody wants to raise their hand, Julie, please go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks. This was uh, was a really great talk. Um, I um, I'm delighted to see uh, somebody explore the possibilities of um, having periods of different um, uh, cadence for the high latitude time domain survey, uh, because that's exactly one of the use cases that we've actually been uh, considering as uh, something that somebody might want to suggest. So my question is, um, uh, we've um, heard uh, several talks this, uh, this afternoon on um, uh, the possibility of untriggered um, searches for kilonova with Roman and um, the idea that this will give us, um, uh, you know, sort of a, a larger um, unbiased sample out to higher redshifts. Um, what kinds of things um, drive uh, an expectation that we're going to see different things from different uh, kilonova or what might drive um, uh, seeing uh, changes as a function of redshift? Because on the face of it, um, two neutron stars seem relatively uh, straightforward um, and sort of all alike. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I must admit, I don't have a very good answer for you. And perhaps some people in the audience will have a much better idea, for example, theorists. But I think um, for, for me personally, whenever um, we, we kind of look at the, uh, if, if we have the ability to explore how something changes with the parameter space, I'm always going to take it up because you, you don't know what you're going to find. But um, I'm, I'm also not a, a super expert on exactly what we will find. So uh, apologies for not being able to answer your question well. Jenny, would you like to help Gila out here? Yes, please. <laughs> Hey. Hello, can you hear me and yes. see me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I think one of the interesting things and, you know, again, anyone else feel free to jump in, but neutron star or these compact object mergers just generally seem to take a very long time to evolve towards merger. And then I think, you know, even in the standard scenarios, there are a lot of, um, uncertainties in the evolution, such as like, you know, whether the system proceeds through a common envelope phase that's going to shrink the merger or like whether you have some dynamic processes that can assemble a, a pretty, a binary with a pretty short um, 
separation, distance, or, you know, there are kind of all of these ingredients that goes go into our models of like how, how we think um, you can actually assemble a system that's going to merge in less than a Hubble time. Uh, so I guess I think that, yeah, just kind of, you know, understanding as we go further back in time, whether we see the population of merging systems changes will tell us something about the ability of nature to make these binaries with um, fairly short merger times. And I think that could be useful and interesting. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, we have actually one more question for you, Gila, before um, which just came in from uh, Saul Perlmutter. Uh, Saul, would you like to ask it or do you want me to read it out? Sure. Uh, so hi, uh, Julie, I, was, I was just asking, uh, what, what, do we, what do we lose um, as we go from the, uh, the two day to the, to the five day cadences? Because um, I, I was looking, looking at, the, at the time scales you were showing, um, it looked to me like we might have a little more time to spare. So I was puzzled, uh, I, I was curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so I think as we go to longer and longer day cadences, um, we require that because it's an untriggered approach, we don't know that it's there in the first place. And so we need uh, maybe two to three um, data points on the light curve to be alert us that it is a possibly a kilonova. And so the longer the time scale, um, then that the, by the time we detect, we figure out that it's a kilonova, it might be over here already. Um, and, and then we don't have, uh, we, firstly, we don't have um, as much time to do follow up. But secondly, it means we need to um, detect, the peak needs to be detected at a much um, a, a brighter uh, magnitude than, than, um, than the limiting magnitude, which uh, then immediately decreases our distance and decreases our rates. So, so I guess I hadn't understood that uh, your goal here was not just statistical. Your goal was actually to trigger other follow up. Oh or, yes. Or, or, or did you? Because I, I assume you have your own follow up just because you're doing a rolling, uh, you know, repeated observation. So you you'd lay down this on a five day grid um, these plots, and I would, uh, and so you'd have a lot of these points already. Yes. Um, so yeah, to answer your question about whether we wanted to follow up, we definitely wanted to follow up so that we can get, we can spectroscopically confirm that it's a kilonova. I think that makes a world of difference to the science that we can do. And so um, with the optical and infrared uh, untriggered search approach, um, I'm also opting, which I didn't highlight, sorry. I'm also opting that we do it in a way that we can detect the kilonova fast enough um, to do follow up, and okay, so you so you uh, so you become the trigger. Uh, you don't depend on another trigger, um, but you actually do want still to do uh, to do follow up. You don't want to just use the, this as a self contained data set. Exactly, and that that's what I'm I'll be doing with this case um, study tomorrow. I'm using DCAM for eleven days. We've got um, infrastructure set up, so I, I think I think Igor is here. Igor is helping with all of this. Um, and a bunch of other people like Armin. Um, we're we're going to do same day data processing, candidate detection, and 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 which will hope allow for killer uh, for follow up if we find one of these. Um, but we don't have even at the optimal in eleven days, we won't get that. But it's a start <laughs> on our way. And then you need a comparably uh, deep um, telescope to do the follow up, so that if you're doing this with Roman, you'll need um, even. What will you need to do the follow-up uh, spectroscopy? That is a very good question, um, and I think we'll we'll need JWST. And that there, there's the problem that you don't get very many, often. You can't do it fast, right? You could probably do it with a two-week, three-week follow-up. Yeah, and I think that points to even more that we would want a faster cadence, and and then we would only get the brightest. Um, events as well, um, but these are these. This is a very good question. I should think through it a little bit more carefully. Thank you. It's good. It's, I'm, glad, I'm glad. I'm glad you're looking at this. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Gile, and uh, good luck with your DCAM run tomorrow. And